First of all, before we will start, I would like to say two things. The first one is that uh, when I, you know, doing lectures, I like to engage the people. So, uh, if you have questions, please, by all means, ask. We don't, we don't need to wait for the end of the lecture. We can do it like it's a lecture, but also, you know, a bit of discussion, right? So you can ask questions. It's everything is good. Everything is fine. Um, and the second thing that I want to say, first of all, is thank you, thank you, Ashuk, <laughs> not only for uh, you know having me here, um, but also about all these uh, years uh, for you know your generosity and support. And I actually prepared something small for you. you know, <laughs> oh, jeez! <laughs> I, I have to leave the room. I, I have yeah. to break down. Come, oh. please, Ashok. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Really, it was my pleasure for the last five years to, to work with you. So I'll leave it away and open it later. Um, you, 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 actually, I can open it now. Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. 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 It's not yeah. for yeah. it. Uh, I want to see it. Yeah. <laughs> nice try. Nice, nice try. try. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> wow, look at that. You know yourself. Yeah, so I'm sorry. Thank well, you, uh, Ashok, for well, everything. Well, yeah. To infinity and beyond. Wow. Uh, <laughs> look at that. Wow. So this is, uh, oh, you know what? Oh, there you go. Thank you, Ashok, for your dream. Ah, here it's on the screen. Oh, that's, ah, that's wonderful. Yeah, it's the same, uh, Thank you, Ashok. So this is a picture of uh, uh, Max Colonius Escher, the Dutch uh, paint, painter. Uh, he liked to paint, uh, to take mathematical concepts and try to, you know, to uh, paint them so we can, uh, s you know, experience it, you know, with our visual system. <laughs> and and I really like this painting, you know, like consciousness try to see everything and see itself. So this is a portrait, you can say, of Escher, for example. And um, yeah, I added the know yourself. This is a sign uh, that was when you know, in uh, when uh, when someone came to Plato Academy in ancient Greek, one of the signs was know yourself. So this <coughs> is uh, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. So thank you, Ashik, for that, and it's also we have you my PhD. Well, so, you, not only am I going to know myself, I'll know how my brain works after you're done. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well. Maybe, I sure. think. Well, I hope at the end of this lecture we'll know a bit more about the brain and the consciousness. Um, and as, as Ashuk, Ashuk said, yeah, we, we met, it was very, I don't know, I, I felt like in a fairy tale or something, you know? We, uh, I just came to listen to uh, a lecture about, of a physicist, by the way, about what is consciousness. Um, and then in the end there was a discussion, and there were like two groups, let's say, one group that thought that you know consciousness comes comes from the brain and another group that thought that it's something that is beyond the brain you know something more universal and and I found myself in a, the minority group <laughs> with Ashok <laughs> and it, you know we thought that it should come from the brain and, um, and and this is how we met actually and later on he again he uh, told me oh come Please let me tell me about your theory and everything, and um, and you know I needed to uh, write a, a research proposal for him, and so I did it in 2016, and this is how we you know we started, and uh, I, we actually I, I it wasn't only a financial help, it was also a um, conceptual and mathematical help. We, we we met and we spoke about it, and it always told me. Try to do a, a blueprint of you know all of your ideas and discuss mathematics. It was a lot of fun, and now after do, five do years, the entropy of us. consciousness. Hmm? Entropy of consciousness. Oh yes, yes. <laughs> she likes entropy very much. Very much. Loves entropy. <laughs> <laughs> so we will not speak about entropy in this lecture. You'll see, it's it's a problem that we have so many areas that we can speak about. I needed somehow to try and to do a you know something compact out of that. <laughs> um, another interesting thing that happened to us is COVID. <laughs> and, <laughs> and because of COVID, um, we couldn't uh, meet. And then 
we had this idea, why don't we do a um, journal club about uh, consciousness and cognitive science. So we did uh, this journal club, it was great, and we read lots of papers about it. And uh, because of this journal club, I noticed that my theory that uh, initially I came and presented him, uh, it's actually, I can split it into two theories. Uh, separate branches, let's say, that explain di different things about the brain. So our brain is so complex that, you know, it's not enough only for one theory. You, know, you need a lot of <laughs> theories. And it makes sense, you know, like we have uh, something like 200 billion neurons in our brain. And uh, something like 100 trillion connections, the synapses between them. It's enormous. Um, I mean, just to appreciate it, if you only take um, like a, a, a pin, yeah, the head of a pin or something, um, this is the size that we'll take from the brain. There will be, uh, there will be over there something like 100,000 uh, neurons and all the connections, if we will like open them, the neurons, and see all the connections, it will last for 4 kilometers. Something like that, mm. right? And if you take from the whole brain, it's something like to circle the whole uh, world, uh, the Earth. So it's so complex that we have no idea how, what to do with it. You know, we don't really have a good mathematical <coughs> tools uh, in order to explain how the, the, the brain uh, function. Um, and in physics, I mean, what we saw until today is that mathematics, this is the language of, of nature. So we need to do something with that, you know, if we want to understand uh, the brain. Um, but today I will not show you mathematics, so, you know, <laughs> uh, so everybody can stay conscious with me. <laughs> now, this is very important, I think, to see for a second how the brain looks like, you know, a real brain. Um, only three pounds and looks so fleshy and, you know, messy, you know, with the blood and everything. And it, it can, you can appreciate how weird it is that this, I don't know, messy thing, yeah, flesh, this is us. It creates our thoughts and feelings and, and everything that we can observe and, and know and, and you know how how this organ do all that it's pretty amazing when you think about it so there are so many challenges and then i saw that i can as i told you i can split um, my theory into two theories right one theory is about how the brain function and um, so we have a philosopher that we come a couple of times in this lecture his name is david chalmers he's very uh famous philosopher of consciousness and he described that uh, in, uh, new, uh, let's say in neuroscience we have two major questions the first one is the easy problem of consciousness and the easy is you know something easy to explain how the brain functions uh, how it creates our memories, thoughts, feelings and everything not so easy right? <laughs> But um, for him, he called it the easy problem because at least we, you know, we understand how to start and, you know, uh, investigate this question, right? And then there is the hard problem of consciousness that he, he thinks it's so hard that we actually cannot uh, solve it, which uh, is, you know, more or less, um, what is consciousness? What is, you know, how... Um, um, how sentient organisms have phenomenal experience. Okay, very fancy words, right? We will speak about it soon. What, uh, what exactly does it mean? But I think that uh, the movie Toy Story 4 <laughs> asked this much better than Chalmers. <laughs> so let's see how they ask this question of the hard <laughs> problem of consciousness. All right? So in the back, can you hear it? Oh, I'm for a kid. Trash? No, no, toy. I am a. We are all toys. Unique, beautiful toys. I will explain everything. How? Yeah. 
how am I uh, alive? that we try to understand when, when we're speaking about consciousness. Uh, but soon, of course, we need, we need to uh, define it much better than that. But you know, this is like, uh, this is a good um, starting point, right? Um, and how come some material thing, you know, can experience the world and experience uh, itself? Th those are the questions here. And now what I realize that I have um, my the I, I have like two theories, let's say. One, I call it chaotic neural networks, and this is more about um, how the brain functions, and you know, to suggest a new ma a mathematical tool from chaos theory in order to explain this complexity and how it works. The other uh, theory, uh, which I call it the relativistic theory of consciousness, tries to solve the how problem of consciousness. Now, each of those can have um, a whole lecture, you know, only about the first one or the second one. So I needed to choose. What do I want to tell you all about, right? And I chose the second one, the relativistic theory of consciousness, just because I realized that this one, I can, um, it's more, I can already uh, write a paper about, you know? And um, uh, so we did it. Uh, and. Um, my friend uh, Zach from so he's he's uh, he's doing his PhD in philosophy of neuroscience in Memphis in Tennessee and I asked I asked him if he wants to join me you know uh, to join forces philosophy and physics all together uh, to write this paper and uh, we wrote it and now it's um, uh, under review in um, uh, frontiers of psychology. So I hope that in a couple of months it will be published and, and um, we'll see what will happen with that because it's actually a new theory, it's different than, than what we have until today. So until today, basically, when people ask, okay, so what is consciousness? You can divide most of the theories to like three categories, three general categories. The first one is materialism, you know, that matter is everything, this is what we have, and, and the neural patterns or matter, you know, with the, its dynamics in the brain, somehow cause or create our consciousness. And this is the first um, kind of theories about consciousness. And then there is the opposite side of theories that say, no, there's something beyond physics, beyond matter, and that's why they call it dualism. <coughs> Um, and uh, this is the source of consciousness. And then the third kind of consciousness theories are pan, uh, we call it panpsychism, that say, okay, it's still in physics, right? But we just need to add more elements to reality. So we know that in reality we have some elements like energy and mass, right? Or space, time, right? So now we need to add another element of consciousness or something like that. Now, uh, we don't have, until today, we don't have any theory, any good theory that explains consciousness. Like, neither of those can, you know, can really explain it, and that's why we need to try to think about more theories. Did you have a, a question about that? No, okay, okay. And now, what we try to do in, with this relativistic theory of consciousness is, so it, it's not uh, dualistic, you know, and it's not panpsychistic. It's even not exactly materialistic, I would say. Um, so it's you no, know, it's part of, um, because and why uh, the reason that I'm saying it, uh, that is that um, we, as you will see uh, later on, um, 
Uh, we, we think it's not true that you know, neural matter just create consciousness. It's a bit more subtle than that. So it's still in physics, it's still you know, what we call physicalist view. It's part of physics, consciousness. Uh, but um, you will see later on that you know, in order to have consciousness, we need some kind of a physical process that involves the brain, but it's not, you know, it's not only that. Uh, so soon you will see what I mean. What do I mean? No? in the end of the lecture, you'll you you'll understand what exactly. Me, do I mean. I so when when you're using the word consciousness, are you talking it some sort of an extraordinary ex uh, feeling or experience? How do you? Very simply, I know it is a deep subject, but how do you simply say that whatever theory you are putting behind, what do you mean, you mean by consciousness? Wow, it's a great question, uh, exactly because now I try to answer your, your, <laughs> your question, so like, yeah, <laughs> I will pay you later. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great question. Uh, how do we define consciousness, right? I mean, what are we talking about? You, you cannot do science if you don't know what we are talking about, right? Uh, we need to define it to know, for example, who exactly has consciousness and who doesn't have consciousness. So, for example, a cat. Uh, does it have consciousness or not? Other mammals, uh, fish, and if you go even to cockroaches, do they have consciousness? <laughs> What about uh, something that is not animal, but still alive, like plants or trees, or the beautiful redwoods that we have here? And what about um, beings? I don't know if being is the correct word for it, but what about something that is not say, uh, uh, alive at all, like rocks? What about run? It's <laughs> <laughs> a very difficult question. <laughs> so this is what we need to understand. Um, okay, so how to define consciousness? Um, first of all, you know, in the natural, is, is there anybody in there, right? Is someone at home? Uh, and you can think about it as if you think about the camera, for example. So the camera just takes pictures, it's automated. And we don't think there is consciousness over there, just do something but has no experience. While when we see, and when you see me right now, you have the experience of me. Uh, you have much more just the, the physical properties of me. You, you feel, maybe I hope happiness, or I hope like, wow, it's an amazing lecture. Or maybe you feel like, eh, you know? But you, you have something here beyond just the, you know, like automated thing, right? Um, but the best, so the best definition that we have in science for consciousness is, well, let me just ask you that. What is it like to be a cupboard? It's a weird question, right? Because, of course, it's, it feels like nothing. It's like nothing, right? It's like to be dead um, because they don't have consciousness. And this is exactly the idea here that um, consciousness is the answer to the question, what is it like? So what is it like to see an apple? What is it like to see red? What is it like to be a shook? Uh, you know, um, oh. if you have an answer, what is it like to be yourself, you know, each one of you? If you have any answer for that, then you have consciousness or conscious experience of this, you know, uh, uh, phenomenon. If there is no, it's like, feel like nothing, like to be a cupboard or something, then there is no consciousness. So this is more or less what I mean. Um, is it? Does it sound um, okay to you know this well, definition? Well, the, yeah, that sounds okay, but the thing is that going back to your earlier thing, does the cat or the dog have consciousness? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, would they be able to answer this? Ah, yeah, great. Okay, great question. So it's not only it's not about report. It's true that only with humans they can report me, right? I can ask you what is it like, and they will report. But let's say that cats also have consciousness, yeah. then they cannot report it, but still, in, to them, they have the answer of what is it like, right? So we cannot ask them that, but as, let's say, as far as the definition goes, they have consciousness, because for them, they have something that is like, I don't know, to, uh, to, to eat their milk or, uh, you know, to, to want, want you to cuddle them and stuff like that, right? So, 
So this is the, uh, the idea here. It's not only about the actual um, act of reporting, okay? Um, but you are right that we have uh, a problem in here that we cannot ask, right? So we need a theory that somehow can give us um, good predictions about consciousness uh, and only then maybe the theory will tell us which animal has consciousness and which doesn't. But we'll, okay, we'll get to that. We are, no, no, the, know, reason, the reason I ask that is because yeah. to me, to me yeah. I think to me it is self-evident that uh, if you look into a cat's eyes or a dog's eyes, you, you just know it has consciousness. Yeah. At least that's the way I feel. Yeah? I think you're right. Uh, I think that most but, of the... But just because a human <coughs> being can sense it doesn't mean that when we cannot sense it, it's not there. Yeah, that's true. Even, I mean, even about you, I don't really know if you have consciousness or not. Maybe you're just very sophisticated robots. Mm. Like, and then, you know, I, it seems like you have consciousness. I, I cannot really know. Uh, and we will talk about it soon, that we don't have any measurement to know if you have consciousness or not. So all of us know only about ourselves that we have consciousness, and then we just infer that others have because, you know, they are similar, have like similar uh, similarities with us. And again, about cats or dogs, uh, we can see a similar behavior that, you know, it feels like that they do have consciousness, they do you know, uh, um, enjoy when we come to our ha to the house, especially dogs. Give it seems a bit, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> and I like it. But uh, yes, so so um, I think most of scientists think that uh, for mammals they do have um, consciousness. By the way, although we cannot measure it exactly. But yeah, for us it's the most important thing, consciousness. Without it, it will be you know, for you. Do we MRI scan on the brain and see the file in the brain indicates their consciousness? Um, we, no, so we cannot just look at the brain and say, okay, now um, the subject has consciousness. Well, it's a tricky question. I will show you soon uh, some... some uh, Something that you know we did with fMRI, for example. Yeah, fMRI is well, yeah. Yeah. So there are good correlations. Let's say, yeah. Um, uh, soon, soon you'll see. Soon you'll see. Okay. It's not a, a question. It's not like a definite. It's not a definitive uh, answer. You know, it's correlations, right? But still, you know, it's something. Still, it's something. Okay. So are we saying that any that thing, at least anything that has brain, has consciousness? No, we were not saying that. This is. To go very far, we don't know. I mean, again, we have no idea okay. about right, birds, exactly. for example. They have brain birds, but are they conscious? Well, maybe, we don't know, <laughs> right? So we still don't know, but that's why we need a theory. When, when you have a theory, then uh, the theory can tell you, you know, what to expect uh, about birds or about... So this is one thing that we need to do with the next paper, you know, by the way, uh, to, to speak about the minimal um, what are the minimal conditions for consciousness? Um, so today, until the end of this lecture, you still you will not know about whether birds have consciousness or not. But you will know some other some other stuff. Something very important uh, to distinguish here is that we can have levels of consciousness. Um, so first of all, like the basic level is just to be. Um, um, to have experience of the world, right? experience of inputs or something like that, and experience of yourself, and not yourself exactly, like experience of feelings, I meant, you know, like to feel happiness, for example. But then there is another layer, if you like, that we as humans have um, of this self-consciousness, that we know that we are, you know, and that also um, when I feel happy, I can stop and say, yeah, now I feel happiness. You see, it's like I, 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 I watch myself from above, you know, and I can say something like that. This is like, we call it self-consciousness. And for example, babies, I don't think that babies have self-consciousness, right? So when a baby cries, uh, it means that um, something is wrong and maybe he, he, he has consciousness already and he feels... Uh, or she, you know, um, sadness. 
but do they know that they are existing right now and that they feel the sadness? You know, they're just feeling it. It's not, right? So, so most likely they don't have self-consciousness, they just have the basic level of consciousness. And let's start with that. Okay, so all of that was to say that we will speak about the basic concept of consciousness, you know, not about higher levels of, you know, how do I need, uh, know to say I and stuff like that, you know. First of all, how, how is it possible that, you know, we have experience at all, okay? Um, and one thing that we do know from neuroscience is that consciousness is just the uh, edge of, uh, like the tip of the iceberg. Um, most of our um, processes in the brain are unconscious. And we decide unconsciously about a lot of things. It's only like the tip of the iceberg that all of a sudden, you know, we have consciousness for, for our decision. Mm -hmm. it's, it's remarkable to see how many things you know, we do, or our brain does, without our consciousness, without us knowing it. Um, and a lot of obvious um, um, things that we take, you know, to be, like, obvious, are not obvious at all. They are all come from our brain. So, when you look at someone and recognize the face, it's because, you know, we, we have a special area in the brain that does it, right? And if this area will not work, then we will not recognize faces, right? So everything that, that we do uh, comes um, from the brain, as far as we know. Um, and so, now... So you have used a number of words for consciousness. You have used experience, feeling, awareness. Actually, awareness I didn't use, not yet. But you're right. <laughs> that, uh, and I hope that all experience is more day-to-day um, -day life than consciousness. That you know, when I say we can experience the world, you will understand what I mean. You know. So what I mean is that without consciousness, uh, it's like to be under under anesthesia or to be to be asleep without any dreams. Right? You just don't have any experience of the world or yourself. Right? Okay. So this is what I mean. Right? Is, is it okay? Is it yeah. What do you mean by consciousness? Yeah? Okay. Great. Great. And now, uh, actually for your question about the fMRI and, and the brain. Uh, so so uh, here, I will show you something interesting. Uh, neuroscientists ask themselves, um, what can we know about consciousness? Right? Let's try to do some experiments, experiments about it. And, um, uh, so they do experiments, and then um, they ask themselves, do we have only one area in the brain that is conscious or not? They call it homonoculus. Do we have a homonoculus you know, in our brain? The, you know, the conscious region of the brain. And the answer, no, we don't have. It's not like that. It's more like a, a network. The whole brain, or a lot of regions of the brain, it seems that needs to work in order for us to be conscious. Um, so, you know, they, they can uh, show uh, mask walls that, you know, it's hard to see. And then you ask the patient, did you see something? Some of them uh, will say, yeah, I did. Some of them will say, no, I didn't. And then you can, you know, you can um, um, analyze it and understand what is the difference between to be conscious to these walls or music and unconscious. Uh, to this world of music, and then you see that um, when when uh, the subjects say something like "No, I didn't hear anything," uh, still the brain uh, reacts to 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 the sound, to the words, you know. But but in a very specific areas, and then when when they do have consciousness, then as you can see, you, you have. Um, um, uh, activation in a lot of areas, right? So this is how uh, we know today that it's not one region or something like that. It's a whole network. And also that it takes time. It takes something like 300 milliseconds until consciousness can emerge. Um, so one milli you, you need like 1,000 milliseconds in order to have one second, right? And so it takes some time. It takes some time until we have uh, consciousness. 
Yes. Yeah. And do you know that because you see, I, I don't know the timing of, of this uh, of, of at that no right, but so I mean, do you see one section of the brain light up, and then 300 milliseconds later, you see five other sections light up, and you say, "Oh, now he's conscious of this work." No, so uh, you read it. fMRI is very good with a uh, special, um, um, uh, how do you call it, special? Equity. Hmm? Equity and quality. Yeah, yeah. Um, more like, you know, it's fine tuning. Resolution. Huh? Resolution. Resolution. Yeah. Thanks. But it's not so good with time, time. Uh, temporal resolution. For that, we use EEG, for example. And EEG is, has, has a very good uh, temporal resolution, and with that you can see, yeah, you can actually detect some kind of um, uh, measurements of the brain waves, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, that when they say, yeah, now I see the world, or something like that, and this is how you can, you know, more or less see that it takes some time, <laughs> you know, like 300 milliseconds. You know, by, by reference, Dennis, your neuron can only fire in, in one millisecond. Cannot fire any faster than that. So each firing is a millisecond in effect at best. Then it has to go into a refractory period. Series of them before. So you have to have 200 or 300 of them before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So one neuron fires in only more or less one millisecond, and then it takes some time until the whole network will, will fire, right? And that's why uh, there are lots of these materialistic uh, theories about consciousness that say that it's some kind of emergence. Uh, one neuron doesn't have consciousness, most likely, but then all of them together, as we saw, somehow create uh, this new property that we call consciousness, right? So this is more or less emergence, like emergence of these uh, shapes here that you see in this uh, lot of stirrings. Yeah. So, uh, on this note about uh, 100 milliseconds for it to be conscious, are you saying that if you were to have an experiment, for example, put someone in a very dark room, mm -hmm. shine a light, and ask them to press a button when they see it, they would always take at least 100 milliseconds for that to happen? Yes, and even, uh, yeah, and even a bit more because you have a bit more time just to yeah, press yeah, the, yeah, the button, least, right? Least, yeah. Yes, this is exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, it will take time until the, the you know, they will say, yeah, now I um, see or hear the, the input. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then, of course, it's, of course, it's much more del, uh, subtle than that because you need to separate. Is it just because of the report or is it exactly the consciousness itself? You know, there are lots of subtleties in here that, of course, uh, that, you know, we don't really know, uh, 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 we don't really have good theory about consciousness. So. So this is what we can know until today, you know? It's, um, it's, but that's why we need to continue to have much better theory. And the reason that I put this big X in here is that the big problem with all those theories that we just still don't know how to solve. Uh, if you remember, Chalmers called it the hard problem of consciousness. So let me show you what is this problem. Uh, and then, after we know what is the problem, then I can show you how, uh, how uh, I suggest to solve it. So, uh, in order to see the problem, first of all, let, let us remember, remind ourselves that the brain is inside our skull. It doesn't see anything, right? It doesn't hear anything. Everything that the brain knows, it's because of the input that goes from our sensory and, and, and modules like the, the, the eyes and, and the ears and, and, and then so somehow the brain needs to take all this, those inputs with the neurons which are just you know electrical pulls and, uh, and uh, pulses and, 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 and chemical neurotransmitters and somehow through that tries you know, it needs, it, it, it needs to, to understand what is out there, what is going on here, right? So, uh, we, in, in cognitive science, we speak about a process of how the brain does it. Of course, we don't know all the details, but again, you know, generally, first of all, we start with sensation, you know, the, the sensory, from the sensory models, and then, uh, after it, it's coded to the neurons, uh, there are lots of information processing until 
uh, uh, the, the brain can understand uh, you know, the shape and everything that uh, the colors and everything. And then we have representations of those, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, representations. Of, uh, uh, this representation it's like a pattern, a new, new neuronal pattern, you know, some kind of firing in the brain. And this should represent, let's say, an apple or something like that or a redness, or everything that you think of, uh, feelings. So for everything we should have some kind of representation of this neural activity in our brain. And then, uh, so this is what we call perception. So from sensation to perception, and then to cognition, or something like that. And this is like to recognize, ah, this is an apple, or to use logic, or to create concepts, you know, so like higher um, you know the higher cognitive stuff, right? So we have we have this like processing, um, uh, processing here from sensation to perception to cognition. Now you can ask yourself why it's different sensation and perception. I mean, is it the same thing? And um, and it's not. What we see, it's not what we perceive. It's not the same thing. So I have uh, an example for you. If you know this, please don't uh, don't say for uh, you know for the others. What do you see here in this picture? Uh, you you don't worry. You can say. You can speak. I will not uh, punish you if you are wrong. <laughs> what do you see in this picture? A cow. You see a cow here. Interesting. <laughs> what what see else? A, see a turtle. Yeah. You see a turtle. Oh wow! <laughs> I see an elephant. An elephant. You see. So we see everybody here, we see different, different things. And, and I see a hand at the bottom, but it's got more than five fingers. <laughs> ah, this one. Yeah, when I looked at it for the first time, I just saw a lot of dots. <laughs> like, uh, you know, it didn't match to anything. Um, but actually, this, there is something here. And you were right, Nick. Did you know about it? No, no. wow, great. Yeah, there are some per uh, percentage of people that can know, can see it. Wow, there is a cow in here. He's right. Let me show you the cow. So here are the. So this is the head of the cow. Right? Oh wow! You see? <laughs> okay, move the face, and then we'll see the cow again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. Now, now I can see, see the cow, right? <laughs> now it's very interesting. What just happened? The sensory input is the same sensory. Nothing changed. Yeah. But your perception has changed. Yeah. Right? The so cognition, is, right? hmm? The cognition. The, uh, it's like, yeah, yeah, it's uh, everything together, right? The perception and then the cognition that you can say, yeah, it's a cow yeah. or something. Yeah. 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 Now right? I see only the cow and nothing else. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's like now it's hard to go back to see something different, right? Yeah. So that's why we speak about sensation, perception, and, and uh, cognition. So what is the health problem in all that? Well, let's take those two persons here. As you can see, they are really excited right now. They're kissing. And I want to measure this excitement. I want to measure what they feel. The actual conscious feeling of excitement, let's say. Right? What can I do? So first of all, I can try to measure some indirect measurements, like their heartbeat or something like that. And I see that it beats very fast. And it's a good correlation that they may be excited, right? But still, it's not the actual excitement. It's only correlation of that. It's very indirect. It's not good enough, right? Okay, so let's go to the brain itself, right? It should be in the brain. Uh, so maybe I can put them inside an fMRI. And uh, I will see the areas that are activated when, uh, when they are excited. Maybe it will be the amygdala even. So we can see some areas or some you know, network or that uh, activates every time that they are um, excited. But still, it's not the excitement itself, right? It's only some activations where it happens, but it's not the actual thing. It's still correlation, after all. There is a good correlation, maybe. Maybe every time that this uh, uh, network will uh, uh, fire, I, it, I, always it will mean, mean that you know, this person has now excitement. 
but still it's only the correlation of the excitement, it's not the actual, uh, the actual excitement itself. So we need to dig deeper, right? So let's say that we are now in the future and we have much better technology than just fMRI and EEG and we can actually go inside the brain and we know everything about the brain and we can scan it exactly and to know exactly you know, how the neurons fire and what they do with all the neurotransmitters and everything and we see the exact representation of the excitement but still, it's not the excitement itself, right? it's only patterns of neuronal activations it's only this representation it's not the actual excitement. So where is this actual excitement? We cannot measure it. You know, we try to measure, we try and try, and what and we always left with some correlations, good correlations, but not the actual thing itself. And this is more or less the problem here. Um, we call it privacy. It seems that our consciousness is private. Now I call a uh, uh, if you want to be more accurate, they call it phenomenal consciousness. For us here, it doesn't really matter. So when I say consciousness, or if you say phenomenal consciousness, this is what we mean. There is, for, in consciousness, there is some, something that we just cannot measure, it seems. Um, we, we try to measure this excitement, and we can't. We can just measure all these uh, representations, maybe. But it's not the excitement itself. So, it seems that um, consciousness, or this, let's say, this experience of excitement, is different than everything that we know. It's different from the body, it's different from the brain, it's different from the neurons, it's different from the representations. So what is it exactly? And if it's so different from everything, it means that it's like, it's independent of it, it's something different, right? So if it's so independent of it, what is it exactly, and how can the brain create it, if it's different from the brain, and different from the neurons, and different from the activity, and different from the representations, how the brain can create it. What is going on here? You know, you see, there's something very, very weird in here. Like, where is the, the, the actual um, experience? Where is the actual thing? What is consciousness? You know? and, and this is, in a nutshell, with the hard problem of consciousness. It's one of the biggest mysteries that we have in, in, in neuroscience or in science, um, I think, because we just don't know how to solve it. <laughs> That's why it's so hard. Um, okay, just, so uh, I will give you two more examples for this hard problem because it's, you know, it's very, there's something in deep that we need to, you know, to consider. So, so, two more, let, let's see two more examples for, uh, of it. But just for you to know, if you heard <laughs> of this word qualia before, this is exactly what they mean, that um, there is some qualities that it seems that we cannot measure. And that's why they call it qualia, from the word quality. Not quantity, it's not something that you can quantify, but something that, you know, of a qualia. Um, and now, um, and now for the other um, example of you know, this hard problem. So this is a very nice illusion. <laughs> Look at uh, uh, the crosser in the center, and then tell me what you see. Actually. What happened uh, with, the, with your uh, perception? <coughs> you can tell me what is happening. So you need to look on the cursor all the time. Focus on that. Ah, different <laughs> colors. Okay. I'm seeing two different colors. Yeah. yeah. Going the opposite. Yeah. Right. So what you see is that these uh, pink dots. And now I'm seeing color on the entire screen almost. The greens are sort of splashing right in the middle as well. So you see the green color, right? Yeah, right. And if I, if I move my eye, and uh -huh. then yes. um, the pattern. Uh, then the, the pattern relative, the color pattern relative to, to the dot moves. Uh, right. And I think the colors invert. Yeah, the colors, that's true. That's true. So what you see is that 
uh, the pink color is disappearing, most you know, uh, more or less. And instead, you see a green, a green uh, color, which is the inverse color. That's true, and uh, it it moves along along this uh, circle, right? Now, it's not out there. It's not true, right? It's an illusion. Everything is here the same, right? If you uh, move your eyes, for example, then you say, no, it's everything fine. The, 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 here are the pink, there's no green anywhere, it's just in your head. <laughs> Again, it's amazing to see how many processing our brain does unconsciously, right? We don't know that it does so many processing and that's why, you know, we see this green uh, dot all of a sudden. But, but now, the question about consciousness is, where is this green uh, dot? So, of course, it's not outside, because it's an illusion. And then, what we are saying is that it's, it's in our head, right? It's in our brain, it's some kind of a representation. But again, as we said before, representation, it's not the actual green. It's not the actual dot, and not the actual green that you see. It's just pattern, like a firing pattern. So again, we don't see the actual experience. I will not find any green dot in your brain, right? I will just find some kind of pattern, and I need to ask you, what do you, what do you see now? And then you will say, oh, I see green, right? I see green a dot. And only then I will understand, so this pattern is a representation of the green dot, right? But I don't know it if I will not ask you, because I don't see the actual experience. I don't see the, the actual green dot that you see. Mm -hmm. okay? So this is again the same problem from a different angle. So we have on the one hand um, these uh, neural patterns in the brain, let's say this is a neural pattern, and on the other side, uh, hand we have consciousness. We have an apple, you know, that I just see an apple. So uh, we call it third person point of view when, you know, other scientists will look and just see your neural pattern and the first person point of view is what you actually see. That you will say, I, I don't see pattern, I just see a round red uh, atom, right? So this is what we need to explain here. How, the question is how to go from these representations into the actual experience of an atom. And uh, we don't know. <laughs> and most likely neuroscience will never have a um, solution for that because neuroscience is all about the patterns. It's all about how the brain works and you know all the firings and the neurotransmitters, but uh, then we'll know the exact pattern and the exact dynamics, but we'll have nothing to say about how to move from that into the, this experience, just because we cannot measure it. Uh, so they call it uh, the explanatory gap. There is a gap that we need to fill. So until now, I gave you a couple of examples for the, the same thing, the hard problem of consciousness. Okay? So all this was just you know, to, to show you from a couple of angles, let's say, what is this problem that now I'm coming here and saying, well, I think I have um, a solution for it, okay? Um, yeah, one final thing uh, about this weird, weird, mysterious problem. Uh, it's, it's a suggestion, again, of David Chalmers. Uh, he called it philosophical zombies. So we know zombies from the movies, right? Here, uh, what he means is, is, you know, if consciousness, we see there is something that we cannot measure there. It's independent of um, uh, the brain patterns and everything. So um, it means maybe that there are some creatures, these zombies, that are the same. They are the same like us, physically. They have the same body, the same brain, the same uh, representations, and, but they don't have uh, consciousness at all. Why? Because, you know, we saw that consciousness is like somehow separate from, from the patterns, from matter. So, it can be, maybe, you know, maybe there, are, there is something like that, like a zombie that has the same physica physicality as me, but no consciousness at all. And, and it's very 
interesting idea, but very weird one because this this uh, zombie is like us, right? It has the same body, the same brain, so it has the same sensation, perception, uh, everything is the same like us. So we can actually ask ask this zombie questions, and it and it will have answer for us. You know, it's like a bit like an AI, like in Facebook, that it can recognize your face or something. Uh, so we can ask this uh, zombie, what, um, what do you see? And it will say, yeah, I see an apple, and I eat an apple, and, um, and it's very tasty. And it say it just because of this representation that it has, although it doesn't have any consciousness at all. And uh, he will actually, he will say to us, oh yeah, I have experience, I have qualia, this is a tasty apple, I see it, right? But this zombie is just delusional uh, because it doesn't, there's nothing behind the, uh, its representations. It's just, you know, this zombie creature just have the, the brain without, you know, this, um, um, without consciousness. So it's very weird. It's very weird. What, what is going on here? Um, and now it was important for me. Uh, to show you the problem in such a depth and to show you what zombies are because now we, we can appreciate the theory and appreciate you know, the, uh, the solution. Um, so, so what I'm trying to say is the problem is that we think of consciousness as something absolute. Either you have it or you don't have it. And, and we need to think about it in a different way in a relativistic way, that then it's not something so absolute, it's, it depends on the observer. So what do I mean by that? What is relativity? Let's go back to Escher, the, the painter. So here, this painting called Relativity, and as you can see here, you see all those people, uh, and each of them has different uh, answers, if you will ask him, them, what is up, what is down, right, you see, he's, down, he's up is done for this person, right? Uh, or something like that. Uh, so it's all relative in here. Uh, look at on those two persons. This one with the red arrow. So what, what does he do right now? Does he go up or down the stairs? Coming down. Coming down, right? And then the purple one is uh, going to the same direction, this direction, right? But what's, what the purple one, what, what does he do? Following. It's, actually, it's, it's a bit hard to see, right? So let's move, let's move to his point of view, what he's saying, uh, seeing. And to do that, I will just rotate the picture. Now it's really easy to see. What is he doing? He's going up, right? So the same direction, if you ask the red dude, what are you doing? He will say, yeah, this direction is going down. But the purple it will say, no, it's going up this direction. So who is right? Both. It, it's relative to the observer, right? So this is what it means to be in, uh, you know, to have relativity. There's no absolute answer, it depends on the observer. And now we know that in nature we have phenomena that are relativistic. For example, uh, velocity. Uh, so can you... Can, oops. can you tell me for... Um, who is moving here? Uh, does the, the, the person inside the uh, train or the other train on the, on the other platform? Oops. The other platform, yeah. my experience. <laughs> Oopsie daisy. Yeah, we, know, we know it, right? We cannot know, right? We cannot tell, yeah. Until the end. Only in the end, and now we see, ah, okay, now we see that it's the other train, right? So this is the relativity part of, um, of velocity. And um, uh, it's deeper than that, that, you know, she can try to do a lot of experiments, physical experiments, uh, to distinguish if she's the one that moves or not. And always she will see, if it's constant velocity, that she is the one that um, stationary, that at rest. Even if she is the one that moves, you know, still all the experiments will show her that she is at rest. So this is... Uh, the relativistic um, uh, point of view, let's say. And now, um, 
what I'm trying to say, the same thing is about consciousness. Oh yeah, I have here some nice example. So you see, we have here Alice outside in the platform, and we have uh, Bob inside the train. And let's say that this train moves. Uh, so in, in a constant velocity. Uh, so Bob creates some kind of uh, measurements and stuff. And always he will say, yeah, I'm at rest. Uh, and you, Alice, and all the world goes backwards, right? But then Alice will say, no, uh, I'm at rest. You are the one that moves. Now, if they don't know about relativity, if they think that there should be an absolute answer here, they will continue to argue. No, no, I'm the one that moves. No, no, uh, you're the one that moves. I'm the one that needs rest, right? And, and in the end, you know, um, she will just say to Bob, well, you just have a delusion, a delusion. I mean, does it really make any sense that uh, you are the one at rest and the whole earth going backwards? Uh, but actually, it's, it's true that, you know, uh, physically speaking, there is no difference between if you are at rest or in uh, you know, um, a constant velocity, if you're moving with constant velocity. So he continue to do all these uh, experiments and always you see that he is at rest. So eventually you would just say, well, you know, maybe it's just a private property that only I can measure because when I measure it, I see that I'm stationary and you don't see it. So I don't know, maybe it's private. Does it, um, does it ring the bell? Yeah. The privacy thing. So this is what I'm trying to say. We just, both of them are wrong, right? They just don't understand that they need to see it as a relativistic thing, right? So the same thing, let's do with um, consciousness. Um, uh, in physics, you know, we say that we have uh, Alice and Bob, they are in different frame of reference. So now, in, in, in our paper, we define something new, we call it cognitive frame of reference. Uh, and Alice and Bob are just different cognitive frames of reference. And then, while Bob will say, I have consciousness, I feel, I don't know, I see an apple. But Alice, when she will um, observe a, a Bob's brain, she will say, no, you just, you don't have anything there. You just have all those, you know, neural firings, and that's it. Uh, and then, you know, he will continue um, to say, no, no, but I actually feel something. Um, and she will say, oh, it's just your delusion. And he will say, no, no, uh, so maybe it's private. Th this is the thing, it's private, right? So this is what we know from consciousness, as we, I showed you before. And what I'm trying to say, this is all just because we did it too complicated. We didn't understand that we need to see it uh, from a relativistic point of view. Um, uh, and so what can we do with it? A uh, um, second, yeah. So what can we do with it? Well, Einstein gave us a good idea. <laughs> what, how, what can, <clears throat> how can we apply this relativistic principle? And what can we do with it with consciousness? Um, so let me give you some example what Einstein did. He um, did a thought experiment. He just thought, he liked to think. You know, he liked to think a lot. And, and he understood that if you are standing inside a spaceship maybe, and there are no windows, so you don't know what is going on outside. So if you are on Earth and, yeah, and you release the ball from your hand, what will happen? The ball will just fall, right? Because of gravity, right? But then he realized, well, let's say that now I'm in space, far away from Earth, no gravity on Earth. But this, you know, the spaceship uh, accelerates up. So now, when uh, uh, this person will, uh, I don't know, just throw away the, the ball, what will happen? The ball just will continue to, to stand in air, right? But because the uh, spaceship goes up, it seems like the ball goes down to, to the floor. Just exactly what would this person will measure if he was on Earth. So, so Einstein understood here that it's the same thing, that gravitational uh, field and 
um, acceleration are, you know, equivalent. Only locally, ain't it? <laughs> so, um, so this was his idea, and then the, this is the most interesting thing that he did. And then he said, okay, let's inf they are the same, you know, the, because the observer uh, measured the same things, it means that they are the same, and so I can infer uh, physical laws from one system to the other. So we know, for example, that uh, when we have acceleration, there is something called the redshift effect of light. The light or the spectrum of the light become more red, let's say. So, and then he said, well, if I'm correct, um, and there is this equivalent between acceleration and gravi gravity, then it means that also on Earth, because of gravity, we should see the same redshift red red, red effect, right? Um, and it took something like 50 years, but they did this experiment, and they found out that he was correct, that there is this effect. So, you see how we, he inferred uh, rules from one uh, uh, system to the other. So let's do the same thing, right? Here I have like a summary of that, that you know, uh, the observer uh, uh, measured the same results, and then it means that there is equivalent between those uh, systems, and then it means that the same laws of nature exist, and we can like infer one thing from one system to the other. So let's do the same thing with consciousness. Let's start with Alice, again. <laughs> now, she's human conscious agent. So she has consciousness in other words. And then let's take her zombie Alice. And I like to call it Alice with this capital. You see, it's like uh, a shorten for artificial learning intelligent conscious entity, or Alice. <laughs> Just my... Uh, <laughs> my way of thinking. <laughs> so let's take this zombie Alice. Now what we know about zombies, we say they are the same, remember? They are the same physically, but just don't, doesn't have any consciousness. But now, but now it's weird, so they have the same systems, the same dynamics in the brain, the same brain, the same representations, the same behavioral reports, everything is the same. Uh, so when she will say, I see an apple, he will say, uh, the zombie will say, I see an apple, and so on, right? Everything is the same. So if it's all the same, then relative, the relativity principle tells us that there's something interesting going on here. We have two different, um, uh, two different systems, at least uh, the zombie, at least. They measure the same results, right? So it means that we have equivalence between them because of this relativity principle. And it's all about the observers. If the observers measure the same thing, it means that there is equivalence between them. And then it means that they have the same laws of nature. But, so, but, yeah. May I ask a question? You know, there's one basic difference here which, uh, uh, between these relativistic systems versus speak up consciousness. Can you speak up a bit? I, yeah. 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 Naveen, even I can't hear you. Okay, <laughs> I'll speak a little louder. It seems that, uh, you see, the one basic difference is when, uh, when somebody, when I look at the, the, the Descartes thing, right? I think therefore I am, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the same concept. The, the one big difference is they are talking about relative things because you're having two different uh, 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 phenomena. You're observing relative one, relative the other. But consciousness isn't like that. So I am. I just. I am conscious. I just know I'm conscious. I don't know if you're conscious. It looks like you're conscious. Right. But if I was trying to predict that, then some of these things might come into play. Yeah. But the fact is, I don't need a second observer, second ob uh, object, to figure out whether I'm conscious or not. I just, I just have that consciousness. I am. Okay, so you started with a good question, and then you, I see that it's a different question. Okay, so also Bob and Ace. When Bob is on the train, and the train moves, he doesn't need anybody else. He just needs himself, let's say, in his measurements. 
to say, yeah, I'm at rest, right? And then Alice will say, no, no, you're not, right? And the same thing is that you don't need anybody else. You know that you are conscious, mm -hmm. right? Now the question is, the, the question that I thought that you asked is, over there with Alice and Bob, uh, it's easy to, let's say, I know what to do in order to switch between them, right? I, Bob can go down from the train and then they will be on the same, uh, on the same page. Both of them will agree. No, but, but, and with consciousness, it's not like that. Like, I never know what you but feel. Me, that's, that's not the point. The point is that I am conscious. It doesn't matter whether uh, uh, Bob is conscious or Alice is conscious. I am conscious. Now, if I am Alice and I'm looking at Bob, I can, I can assume that maybe Bob is also conscious. Mm -hmm. Just like the example of the dog or the cat that we were talking about. I, I, it seems to me that the dog is conscious, but that, of course, I can't be sure. It's just like when we are ordering Alexa around. Alexa, we think yeah. might be conscious, right? It's not right. artificial intelligence thing. But I'm not talking about projecting the consciousness. I'm talking about I am conscious. Mm -hmm. right? So what is the difference between that and between the Because there's example? no second observer. There's no second observer. You're not talking about one relative to the other. So there's no second observer here as well, right? Let's, let's go to the, to the train. Uh, there's only one observer here. Just okay, Bob. so Bob says he's, he's, he's conscious. That's fine. Yeah, so even before, not about consciousness, about about um, velocity. Okay, say. so right? he, he's addressed, and there yeah. actually, you're right, uh, Einstein showed that it really doesn't matter. It's actually irrelevant whether right. they, one thinks is at rest and the other is moving or not. It yeah. actually doesn't make any difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but my point is, is that you have it here only, let's say, if you don't have Alice, still, he will, uh, Bob will uh, measure that he is at rest. You only need one uh, observer, let's say. Right? Mm -hmm. Just as in consciousness, you only need one observer. Okay? This one observer will say, I'm conscious. Or this one mm -hmm. observer will say, I'm at rest. It's the same, you know, an analogy. Uh, let's no, say. I, 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 I'm not sure. Can, can you. Yeah, the, the, I think that the problem is you guys are asking different questions. The question that I want answered is mm -hmm. why is it that Alice sees an apple and Bob sees has an experience of an apple also, but it might be a completely prioritized experience in each case. Okay. Is, there a, is there a function that correlates the two experiences? Okay, so it's a different question than yours. You mm -hmm. say, I'm conscious, yeah. that's all that matters to me. Mm -hmm. I don't care what Bob or Alice is thinking. Mm -hmm. That's it, I'm solved. I don't want to study consciousness anymore. No, no, but, no, no. But no, no, the, the, the question that's not, that, that, no, that's, that's not, that's but not. But the question, I no, 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 wait, 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 yeah. wait, 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 wait. Yeah. So the question that we are asking is different question we are asking is, when two people observe certain things, is there a relationship between their observations? So their private experiences, do they have a relationship? Einstein didn't say that it doesn't matter whether it's this or this. He also showed ex relationships between different okay. inertial frames. Mm -hmm. And what Nir is getting to is, can we create relationships between private experiences of different people? So your consciousness, my consciousness, his consciousness, can we create? That's a different question. That's exactly, that's the question he's asking. I know, but that's a, but to me, that's not the fundamental question. That's, that's so your I private. Pri that's well, your why private. Is it not why not? Question? Why is it not fundamental? Uh, it's actually hard because I, I, it's just a hard problem, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. What is it that I'm feeling? When I say that I'm conscious, what is it that I, I'm, I'm... How do I translate that into something? But I just know that I'm, I'm conscious. I am. Mm -hmm. I exist. Okay? Right. Now, whether need exists or not, I, all my experience, everything tells me that he does exist. But then also sometimes I might be fooled that Alexa exists. Right? Right. So you're asking how come, yeah, now I understand your question, how come you just know that you exist and for right. other stuff, right. you just don't know? How that's come right. there is this in fact, difference? In fact, that's, that's, that's yeah. the interesting thing, that if you look at what everybody knows about knowledge, 
almost anything you can you can convince somebody that hey that's not really true i mean that's the history of science right we we think something is true and then we find <coughs> out that no it's really not there's uh, further things to look at and different ways to look at it etc but this one simple fact nobody could convince me that i don't exist right so what you're asking is how come i can Cast doubt. I doubt everything. Great. Right. But right. the only thing I can even, doubt even, is even two plus two may not be four. It might two might yeah. two plus two may be five. In fact, I can right. develop a new mathematics. Yeah. Right. So we can think about it. So the answer is, if we from relativistic point of view, it all starts from the observer. There's nothing above and beyond the observer, right? He or she. Sorry, you know, in Hebrew everything has a she or he. So if sometimes I say he or she, it's because, you know, I translate it into Hebrew, so... <laughs> also so, Hindi, by the way. So, yeah, also, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, observer, it's a he, apparently, <laughs> in Hebrew. All right, so, um, there's nothing above and beyond the observer. Uh, so we start from, the, from this observer. Um, what, what it means is that uh, for this observer, what, uh, what uh, he or she will measure, <laughs> Uh, will be uh, the will be what everything that there is. You know, there is there is be nothing uh, above it. So because we start from from the observer, um, this is what all there is. You know, there is nothing beyond it. So when you measure, um, let's say that when you measure a cup, yeah, when you see here, this cup. Uh, this is your measurement. So for you, this this is what there is. There is nothing different. You know, there is nothing else. Uh, so for you, this uh, is the truth. Need, I mean, this you know, is the, your uh, reality. Uh, well, need, let, let me let me just suggest something. Mm -hmm. It seems like uh, you're already assuming, implicitly assuming, without explicitly, explicitly assuming, you're already implicitly assuming a materialistic. Uh, interpretations. Oh yeah, I mean this is part of physicalism. First of all, it's part of physics. So I'm yeah. assuming that um, a consciousness ha a, has some kind of explanation through a, some physics. Maybe we, we don't know this physics. Maybe you know there are like uh, laws of physics, laws of the universe that we still don't know, and they are the one that will explain consciousness. Maybe, but it's part of physics. I'm assuming here uh, physicalism. Right. I don't assume so that it's one of the dualist, consequences, you know? mm -hmm. one of the consequences of what you're assuming is, that if, if one could clone every single atom of your body with some other physical system, every single thing, that it would have the same consciousness as, as you. Right. So this is. So that's the physicality sure. issue, you know, which is, mm -hmm. which is the the hard problem comes down to that, is that if I can duplicate you completely, will I also duplicate? your subjective experience. Okay, so wait, before we say that, so let's uh, um, uh, see it just in, 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 you know, in the lecture itself. You see, I called it the equivalence principle of consciousness. Yeah. And just I wanted to, to, what I tried to show here is that if we take uh, this conscious being and it's zombie, because they measure the same thing, they have the same laws of physics, so it means that also they have this, the, both of them, is a consciousness, a phenomenal consciousness. So, so according, if we are uh, taking seriously the relativistic principle, it means that zombies cannot uh, exist, you know, it, because it's the same, you know, they measure the same thing, uh, there's nothing above and beyond the observer, so also zombies have um, consciousness, right? So this is what I should try to say here. Um, and of course, so here I presented this argument um, philosophically. But of course in the paper we have mathematics for everything. And from the mathematical uh, point of view, then I actually, uh, we can show that uh, this repre you know, the representations that this zombie has, so when, when this zombie uh, measures them, it measures them as consciousness, you know, as is what we call a quality, if you like. Uh, so, so let me sum. Let me summarize 
the, the ideas ago. In the beginning of the lecture, I, I told you that this relativistic theory um, is part of the physicalist uh, view, but it's not exactly materialistic from, in that sense that uh, neural matter doesn't create consciousness mind. And what did I mean here? I meant that it's not true. We don't need to find this um, function or um, a mechanism how to go from representation into consciousness. It's not true that, that you know, this caused this. No, but the thing is, that's not the essential thing. Well, one second, just let me, just okay. let me finish the, you know, sure. the, the, the idea. Sure. Okay? So the idea is that because now we are in a relativistic point of view, it's all about measurement, right? The observer itself. So one, one observer uh, will see the same reality, underlying re reality, as um, a consciousness, and another one will see it as um, just patterns, right? Both of them are right, uh, and uh, it should just depend on which uh, cognitive frame of reference you are in. How much AI you put in there, basically? How much what? AI, how much artificial intelligence you've done to translate one to the other. No, okay, so now the question is, what does it mean to be, yeah, where I, I say something like that somewhere here, that you need to be in the right uh, cognitive frame of reference in order to see consciousness. And what it, does it mean? What is this right um, cognitive, so what, let me see where is it, it's somewhere over here. Uh, second. Yeah. So the right cognitive frame of reference means that in this cognitive uh, system, those representations actually do something. They have what we call causal power. Uh, they are exactly the ones you know that are in this dynamics of sensation, perception, cognition. They are the one, they are like the fuel, if you like, of the dynamics. They are the inputs and the outputs of the whole dynamics. So if you are in that particular um, uh, cognitive frame of reference, then you will measure those representations as consciousness. Right? So, in other words, when I look at Ashuk and I open his head and I look at his uh, brain, the only thing I can see is just those representations. Just because uh, those representations, it's, you know, for his dynamic. You know, uh, it's not for my dynamic, right? Uh, but for him, because those representations are the one that created dynamics, that's why for him, you know, it will be an actual apple, let's say, or happiness, or something like that. And now, a very important the point here is that if it's correct, then there should be some kind of transformation that I can uh, um, go, I can transform myself to be a shoe, you know? So there should be here, again, in mathematically speaking, there should be like some kind of a transformation, how we can move from one cognitive system to the other, and then we can do it. So. There is like a futuristic prediction here that, you know, in the future, maybe, if we will know um, Ashuk's uh, dynamics and representations in mind, there is this machine, let's say, that, you know, will create, that I will have the dynamics and representations as Ashuk. And then I should be Ashuk. I should say, oh, now I know what is it like to be Ashuk. Now I you know I experience what Ashuk experience. So it's not private anymore. So now consciousness is not private as we thought. It's just hard to, you know, uh, to, uh, to do this transformation, but it's something that can be done. So, so, this is, so, so that's why now there is no hard problem anymore. Uh, because it's not, first of all, it's not private. And secondly, um, there is no explanatory gap anymore. Because it's not that we want that um, a, a neural activity will create consciousness, it's that both of them are the same thing from different point of views. Okay? So you, this you, is more or less the idea. Yeah. Some people would say 
that you already implicitly assume the assumption to the hard problem mm. when you say that everything is physically represented. Mm. represented. Mm. So since you're so, believing in the physicality, you're already throwing away the consciousness, you know, the baby's being thrown away with the bathwater in a way. So you're always going to represent the hard problem in a, in a physical representation. That's your assumption. So no, this is not the assumption. The assumption is that there is some kind of physics that right. should explain consciousness. But this physics, for example, can be panpsychism. It can be that there is another element for nature and physics of consciousness. It, uh, it can but that's be the hard different, problem. right? It can be like a lot of different um, theories, if you like, about what is consciousness. I just say that it should be a theory that, you know, will be included inside physics. This is, this is the only thing that I'm trying to say here. So it's very broad physicalism. It's not that I'm throwing away everything and throwing away consciousness. Just saying, no, it should have, it should, uh, it should be part of the physical laws. And it might be that we still don't know what are those physical laws, and maybe they are very different than what we know today. Okay? Yeah, but I think the, the big problem in the hard problem, the big issue in the hard problem always is whether we conscious people are just sophisticated zombies, okay? That's the issue. And as Daniel Dennett says, that you, when you think of yourself as consciousness, you overestimate your consciousness and you underestimate the intelligence of, of a zombie that's possible. Right. So, in his opinion, we are just very sophisticated zombies, but we, we sort of underestimate what a zombie would be if he was as complex as us, and we overestimate our consciousness as being something more profound than a zombie. But that, you know, that is something that Chalmers wouldn't agree with. Chalmers says there is actually a difference between us and the most sophisticated zombie, yeah. and th that is, you know, something that is materially, you know, qualitatively different. Exactly, this is what we started with, right? That as zombies, they physically like us, but still doesn't have this consciousness. And the, uh, the issue here is when we take seriously the relative, relativistic principle, then we say, wait, it's weird, they are the same. The observers are the same, exactly the same results. So they should be the same if relativity principle is correct, right? So, and then you say, okay, so there are no difference between zombies and conscious beings. If you have the same physics, then you have also... But that's, that is the assumption that you start with. Yeah, that's the... the so problem. basically you're, you're, you're starting with the, the resolution of the hard problem, in effect. No, because again, the, I start with two things. So I start with broad physicalism. It's yeah. still not any Which resolution here because there are lots of different theories inside broad physicalism. It could be panpsychism, it can be materialism, and it can be what I try to do here, which is a bit different. So, broad physicalism still doesn't give you an answer. It just means maybe that dualism is mm -hmm. incorrect. That's it. And then the other assumption is, okay, let's assume um, a relativistic, the relativistic principle, that if two observers have the same results about everything, then uh, the same physical laws are uh, in force in those two systems. So they have the same physical laws, and because of this broad physicalism, it means that they have, both of them, have uh, the same consciousness. And this is the but you know, argument. The, the, the thing that you're doing here is you're, you're trying to say, okay, a person a thinks that person B is or is not conscious. They're trying to determine that. That's not the uh, the central question, I don't think. You're not trying to understand whether the other person is conscious. Am I conscious? And I think I am. What the heck is that? What What does that mean? Uh, in what way? Why am I conscious? What is it that's making me conscious? Right. And the answer here will be that you are conscious because you are a cognitive system that uh, measure its own representations. And this measurement create a new property, if you like, this um, right. bio, phenomenon. Yeah. So, so, so as Ashok said, you're really assuming that physica physicality or the materialistic interpretation. 
So again, it's not a materialistic interpretation. Okay, right. The materialistic, they will say no. Okay, physically. You know, actually, you know, the um, the activity itself creates consciousness, and I say here no. The activity doesn't create consciousness. You know, it's it's the more subtle than that. It's the uh, the actual relativity. Neil, do you think we can create conscious machines in silicon? Oh yes. So that have consciousness like humans do. I mean, even here you can see that all that it takes is to, to create a cognitive system with representations, right? And when it runs, uh, the dynamic runs, it can be conscious, more or less, right? Um, so even here in this simplistic um, uh, view, you can see that we can do it on AIs. But I just have to say something here that it's very simplistic. And in the next paper, we need to, to check about what, about what we started with, you know, which animals have consciousness or, or not. We need to start to, to think about what are exactly the minimal conditions for consciousness. Because here, what I just spoke about is about humans and zombie humans, right? And so, of course, we humans have consciousness. It's easier, let's say. But what? Okay, but in the next paper, we need to go deeper into what are exactly the conditions to have this measurement. The problem is you're framing the question with an implicit assumption in there. That's the problem I, I see. In so other it, words, you, uh, you, what is the implicit uh, assumption? Th that it is uh, an emergent uh, quality that's going to emerge from this, because, from the physical combination of things. So this is not, this is not what I'm saying again. Yeah. It's not an emergent. No, but that's what your question is assuming. What is the minimal set of condition for phenomenal consciousness? Oh, sorry, yeah, to emerge. It's to emerge here. So it's, it's assuming. Not world. This is not a good world. Okay. Yeah? This is <laughs> not a good world. This is because in, in, in relativity it means that it's not that something emerged from the other. They are both right, they are both, both correct from just different sides, right? So no emergence, right? This is a wrong. Well, okay. the you, I will uh, change it later. It should. It's. It's not about emergency. It's about to see the same underlying reality from two different um, uh, frames of reference. Okay. This is. So this is the idea. Uh, it's. So it's different than emergence and different from the reductionist materialism that tries to say that consciousness is just you know. Uh, the activity or like complex activity. It's more than that. It's the activity and the measurement. Uh, this measurement means... Okay, so uh, what Ashok was saying earlier about if every atom is the same. Could you download Ashok in, theoretically into a computer and then uh, reactivate that into a... I, I think the question that's coming up, on, in my mind at least, is that you know you started the, con the conversation with the 200 billion neuron and the 1 trillion connectivity between them. So the question is, can we, can we, using that concept, can we replicate Ashok's brain and provide the same consciousness that Ashok has on the second person? Can you do that? Or are we there yet? Or we are not there yet. It, it, we are still in a theoretical discussion. Theoretical, it's still a theoretical discussion. Why is this question to be answered? So this is we still haven't understood what consciousness is. That's that's right. That's, that's it. Right. Cuts that's down what I'm getting at. Because the idea right. of the apple, right? right. When, yeah. when you see an apple or I see an apple, behind that observation are memories, are all the sensations that come with looking at that. And so there's, I think the conversation up to now has been, is it you know. Your, your point of view of the apple and my point of view, can there be a transformation? Yeah, that's a, that that's a different question, yeah. Yeah, but, but, but actually this minimum set of conditions, if you will, gets to the actual question of what, how does an observer actually yeah. look at the apple, right? I mean, that's, that really gets to the heart of this, this, this definition of consciousness. And then I can I can tell you the answer, but then it will be another hour. So <laughs> this is for the advanced lecture. But uh, uh, what you're right, I mean, your question is very very important, right? If we can live forever like that, then what, right? So for that we need 
we need two things. The first thing is the easy uh, problem, as uh, Chalmers said, right? To understand how the brain works and then to try and copy it into the cloud or something, right? Into a computer. But then the, the, the hard problem, as you said, will be, but then will, will it still have consciousness? And will it still be, if it's Ashuk's brain, will it still be Ashuk? Yeah. Right? And according to this uh, theory, yes. If it's exactly the same, so again, the, uh, because it will be the exact same dynamics and same representations, so the, um, there will be no difference between the uh, measurement results of this uh, uh, computer issue uh, and the real issue. And that's why, again, because there is no difference according to relativity, it means that it's the same. Right? So the same uh, physical uh, laws will be also on this computer issue. So because this computer issue will say, well, I'm a shoot. I don't know who is this guy. But this is me, you know? So it will be very interesting to see what will happen with that. Well, you know, according to Roger Penrose, even if you modeled the entire 100 trillion connections and the neurons, you, you would not be modeling the complete show exactly. Because you have to go down to the nanosecond time frame. Because there are things happening, you know, in your brain, things are only happening at one millisecond time frame. The neurons cannot fire any faster than that. So the entire model of the brain with all those connections can only run with a clock of point one millisecond, tick, 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 tick. But at another level in your neurons, for example, there is stuff going on at the quantum level. There's nanosecond changes occurring. And it's quite possible that my consciousness not, not only involves the brain and this neural clock, it involves much more faster clocks. It's like the Hofstetter's uh, pinball yeah. machine, right? Yeah. So there are different time, time clocks in, in, all, in, the, in the consciousness yeah. and the brain is just one time clock but there is, there is neural time clocks and so on that are inside us that might be quantum. Right, so and because we don't have theory yet about what is consciousness then there could be a theory that say well it's not enough just to, to look at this cognitive level, the dynamics of sensation, perception and uh, cognition. Maybe it's also about quantum effects, yeah. like, like, uh, uh, also, and what, what, what also I'm understanding, right? what, what I'm understanding here is that the, even if we replicate Ashok's brain, we do not, we have not at least at present have metrics to know whether or not we have really replicated the, the brain of Ashok because of the Physically, you mean or about consciousness? Consciousness. Ah, yes. That's what I mean. Consciousness. Right. We can only ask. We can only ask this. Uh, you know. Yeah, well, you know, computer. we don't. We don't really care if we have methods today. What we care about is: is it possible to? Yeah. In a, in a world where you yeah. could have an infinite amount of yeah, things. Exactly. But some people say that even in that world, it's not possible yeah. Yeah. to replicate someone completely. So that's another level of complexity that comes in, right? Because we talk about, you know, almost a non-physical uh, sort of a golem in the in the works, like Descartes, uh, this monster that might be there, which is non-physical. So, so, so what is your opinion? Can it, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years from now, is it possible to replicate Ashok's brain? On a <laughs> having the same consciousness? Is it, or is it desirable? So, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it even yeah, desirable? You want to want to register right now, so you know you have an answer. I, said, no. <laughs> I, I better go out and get a copyright on my brain. Because I'm waiting for the day that we'll have avatars. So it's not only that we will replicate a shoot to the computer, but actually, actually you can have a new body as well. Without any body, it's like it. What do you think about... Uh, Wait, let's say uh, we have more questions. Okay. Yes. Well, I'm going to derail the conversation, so maybe you guys should. Huh? I, I have a question that might derail the conversation. So might go ahead. Derail. Derail. Yeah. So, might derail. derail. Uh -huh. um, so in Einstein's theory of relativity, one of the things that uh, you get from this whole thing is a way to derive the transformation between frames. Yeah. And here you're saying that at some point, can you also derive the transformations between cognitive frames in your theory, or is yeah. that something that you're still working on? Yes, so I, uh, but okay, we need to be uh, 
careful here. Yes, I have a transformation that uh, can take us from um, what we call a third person perspective and to first person perspective, right? So I'm looking and just see this mm -hmm. uh, activity, mm -hmm. but you will say, no, it's an apple, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I have a, a, a transformation for that. To go yeah, from, from um, you know, activity into the actual uh, qualia, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, but what still I don't have is, okay, now the next stage will be how to take my representations and, you know, to transform them to, uh, to be, you know, Ashuk representations. So for that, this I cannot do yet because we still don't know the, you know, um, the physics of, you know, how to, how to describe those uh, representations and how to move from one representation to the other, mm -hmm. right? So I don't have this part. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. This will be more about the if if I'm correct about the chaos theory that can you know explain how the brain functions, then uh, it will lead us to you know how exactly what is the representation in the brain it looks like and then how maybe to transform one with another. Right. So this is for the future. But yeah, for now I do have a, a transformation how to go from third person perspective to first person perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, I, and also I can show, you know, that it preserves uh, all the, let's say, the formulas of the, um, um, what we said, the um, sensation to perception to cognition. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I model this and I show that with this transformation, I still, you know, I preserve the form of those uh, formulas. So exactly, you know, uh, try to mimic what Einstein showed us, you know, it should be. Should that, you know. mm -hmm. So yeah, this is not the end.